got a derby coming up at Addington Raceway in less than a fortnight, so we've got some historics to play out over the next couple of weeks, starting with the Easter Cup winner. Dexter going into the Derby series, he already had an imposing record, didn't he? Including a Group 1 placing a second in the Northern Derby. Yeah, he'd come on the scene pretty quick, uh, Greg, and he'd raced um, super leading up to the Derby, I think. It was, and he had you know, 11 or 12 starts leading into it, but his, uh, his form was impeccable, really. He'd been beaten by some pretty smart ones, but he'd uh, won some pretty good races as well. The Flying Stakes, the traditional lead-up race, uh, he actually got beaten in it, not by much by a sire, but uh, he had to sit parked in that. Yeah, he did, you know, and um, so I just got him late. Um, but it was a good run leading into the derby for him. We were, you know, wrapped with the run and knew he improved with fitness wise. So um, we got beat, but we weren't too worried leading into next week's race. He only broke 2.19, which was just outside Stun and Cullen's record at that stage. On to the derby. He drew about the middle of the front row, but it wasn't a whole lot of fun early doors. No, I'd actually sort of planned on just going back early and just letting him settle. And, um, you know, make a mid-race move and get him handy then, but he, um, there's a bit of action probably around him as the gate left, and he, um, unlike him, got pretty fired up, so um, we yeah, reluctantly had to end up going forward, and we are pretty wide going to the first bend, but, uh, you know, end up getting sort of part going into the back, but it wasn't the original game plan, but um, just had to go with him. And that was outside his sire, his nemesis the week earlier. You got home in 54-6, and it was one heck of a home stretch battle. Yeah, it was. I was probably a little bit worried getting to the 600. I pulled really hard, um, you know, as the race went on and um, it got to the 1,000. He really latched on pretty hard, so I thought it has to be pretty good to, um, you know, stick on, and especially the side got a pretty cheap run in front. Um, and then we got to the sort of 500 and um, Ned sort of put the foot down. I thought it was in a little bit of trouble, really. Uh, I got left that foot a little bit, but to the horse's credit, he's just so tough and, um, you know, like you said, it was a good bat up the straight, but he... Made a sticker as a uh, biggie there. Isaiah half a length, Lockerburn. Bassini the inside. Still Isaiah, the big fella, Lockerburn. He comes now. It's Isaiah and Lockerburn, the two. Isaiah, Lockerburn. Lockerburn, and he won it. The Chapman family, they own him. Didn't quite have the right colours on that night, though, even though Cran at that stage was training. Yeah, that's my fault, Craig. I, um, I take all the colours for Cran's horses, and I just barely left him in the wardrobe that night, but I don't care for, you know. I have got about it, but uh, yeah, we were all Queen's colours, but it, um, you know, it was great for Kevin and um, Barb and Chapman's, you know, they've been great supporters of mine, so it was uh, great to get a win like that for them. New Zealand Derby, where does it sit amongst all of the great races you've won? Well, I'd run pretty second in a few of them leading up to it, and um, yeah, I really wanted to win a Derby, and uh, it did mean a lot, you know, at the time. We celebrated pretty well that night, for you, to be fair, because, uh, you know, we'd... Uh, Sort of just missed the year before. Um, got beat by one of Perth by that nose, I think. So um, something I really, really want to win, and it um, sits very really highly in my uh, CV. Let's go to another Derby historic. Uh, the man they call the King, with one of his favourite horses of all time. Ken, after taking out the Northern Derby and, of course, a Derby in Australia, there was never any doubt about favouritism for the New Zealand Derby. Yeah, Greg, he was, he was starting to stem himself as the best three-year-old, not only here, but probably in Australasia. He was just so fast and, you know, he'd been there and done it and, <clears throat> you know, he was qualifying in October for the size stakes and he, he was racking up the group ones. So, yeah, he, he was always the one to beat. His lead-up race was in the flying stakes. He didn't win it, though. He was third behind Hunker Hickling, but I know you were very pleased with that performance and, and you had real confidence going into the derby, although the draws didn't fall your way. No, well he, you know, he's probably one dimensional in the fact that he, he, he couldn't do work. Well he, he actually could do work but he needed cover so, um, you know, he, if the race unfolded for him, if they went hard enough, then he was always going to be a player. So it didn't really matter the draw. There was a huge cosmetic change at Addington Raceway, not only with the pylons but a, a passing lane and that became the key focal point post race which probably took away some of the gloss from his win. Yeah, it did, Greg, because um, yeah, a lot of people thought he shouldn't have held the race, and I don't think they they don't realise that he actually did nothing wrong. He um, he came around them probably four and five, six wide, and swooped to the lead and went, ran down in and ended up in the passing lane, and they changed the rules after that. But, you know, he didn't interfere with another horse, and he was clear of all of them, and that was just what he did. He switched off when he hit the front, so, um, yeah, no, we held it. Went on to win another derby in Australia, stamping him as one of our very best three-year-olds of all time. 
Yeah, well, I mean, not many horses win one or two derbies, but then Holmes DG and Courage Under Fire, and then this guy won four, so, you know, he's a great horse. Him stars and Stripes goes wash, and down the outside he goes, he surges to the front. Stars and Stripe, Falcons, Blue Jean and Mike's pal coming from the back. Stars and Stripe, he's running all over the place. He's pretty green, he's holding, he's tired. Down to the line, he gets there. the son of Peter Baggery. Tom had his first win here with D.D. Trotter, appropriately driven by D.D. himself. Yep, um, obviously related, uh, Dexter Dunn and Tom Baggery. Good kid, really nice, personable sort of guy. Um, not a shrinking violet by any means, Greg. And he's only got the one horse in work, I believe. Yep, that's right. And this horse here had the nine starts. It was always going to win a race. She's looked uh, close uh, yeah. on a couple of occasions. By Monarchy, just a couple of times across itself at the start. This time got it perfectly right, and Dexter got a uh, nice one over sunny afternoon. And if you've got to beat somebody in your first first ever start, uh, your first ever training win. Peony. <laughs> Peony yeah. is not a, bit, not a bad uh, scalp to get, so well, well done to you. And yeah. she'll go around in the Oaks sunny afternoon. She's yet to win a race, but mm. don't be surprised to see her finish in the top four. Well, we look at that Oaks field later on, gee, it's a deep Oaks field, fellas. Yeah. Some mm. year the Oaks is like, mm. this year it's like, wow. Mm. Yep, for sure. Okay, also at Mott on Monday as part of the Akaroa meeting. Have a look at the horse that started off the back mark there. We've seen him before, Michael. Sam. Yeah, Sam was his name in the race book. His name, you've probably been known better as Monkey King. Uh, one of $3.3 million. Uh, we'll, we'll show you this footage. That's Gavin Un Smith. Unreal, unreal story here. Only broken into the saddle on Thursday prior to the Monday. Yeah, and look at him, the old pro. 14 years old. Um, it, we all love Sam. He, he gets beaten here because he probably hasn't done too much work in the last four years of his life or something close to it. Um, he gets, uh, like, they, they often have people go there and have a drive of, of him and, yeah. and the dual sulkies and that. And um, It's unmistakable, the gate. It does raise a question, fellas. Like, they have Montes in Australia. Now, they're for the Trotters, which is basically a horse ridden under saddle. They're huge in France, massive. So we have we don't have Montes in New Zealand. I don't bet on the Montes in Australia, but it's, it's, it's something different. It breaks up the race meeting. Now, do I want to see Montes at Addington? Absolutely not. Mota Carrara, Methven, Reefton, Amonti, six or eight horses, break up the card. If you don't like it, don't bet on it. I don't bet on amateur drivers' races. Mm -hmm. But they still have a place in the industry. What yeah. do you reckon, Craig? Oh, I, think, I think on the grass track summer circuit, it'll be the sort of thing the general public will go, wow, that's really interesting. I've never seen that before. I tend to agree with you. I think the summer circuit's the way to go. They had one at Franklin about six weeks ago, um, uh, Greg, uh, a saddle trot, uh, or saddle pace as it was, with five or six runners there around Franklin. It's probably not ideal because it's a tight turning track. But I think on a track like Mott or Meth and on the big grass tracks, I think it's got a place. Yeah, and well, good on Kendra Gill. She, she put it together and she won the race. It's another outlet. It, it's a place these older horses can go. When they first started them in Aussie, they were just rubbish. They were terrible. Now they're down to sub two minutes mm. under saddle, trotting mm. around Melton. So look, I, I think it's got to play somewhere at the picnic meetings because any way we can attract people to go into the races and not make it ten of the same thing, a lot of people have that same argument about standing starts. It, it's a point of difference from mobiles. I agree. Mm. There's something novelty over the summer, yeah. And a real novelty for the connections of Shadow Man who just beat the two-time New Zealand Cup winner. Oh, so uh, good on them.